Professor Anu Oja uh, from the UK Space Agency. Welcome to Australia in Space TV and welcome to Singapore for the GSTC. It's great to be with you, Chris. Now, we've had you on Australia in Space TV before uh, from London. Uh, now, the Director of Championing Space, off camera we were talking about what that involves and basically uh, it's a pretty large job title. What does that actually involve? And we'll then move into what brings you to Singapore, what the UK Space Agency is doing here in Singapore. But championing space, it's a pretty critical role. Yeah, some people love it. Some people are like, what's that all about? <laughs> and, and the way I think about it is championing space brings together the agency teams that are critical enablers, not only for everything the UK Space Agency does, but I would say for all space activities. So what are those teams? Well, first of all, we've got our international team and our European Space Agency team. So when we're looking at the UK and what we can do in partnership, you know, two thirds of our funding goes into the European Space Agency because we can then work with other countries to really build up world-class expertise on our missions. But then allied to that, what about our future workforce and capabilities? So we've got our education team. What about our ministerial engagement? So we've got our parliamentary and public affairs team. And then critically, what about our communications and engagement? Because for all of the great space stuff we do, we need to be telling the general public about it. We need to be telling policymakers about it. And we need to make sure that those are working together so that we can keep building the support that we need. Because ultimately, our space capabilities are absolutely essential for the way we live our lives in the 21st century. Space is no longer a nice to have, it's a must have. You're, you're the, the way you structured those teams, international and ESA, they're different teams, right? So international is everything beyond the European Space Agency? Yeah, but there's a close uh, partnership working together because, yes, we're part of the European Space Agency. We, we, in fact, the United Kingdom was one of the founding members of ESA back in 1975. We've now got 22 member states. We also have individual relationships with those member states within ESA. And then, of course, we've got our international relationships. And sometimes, it gets a bit confusing then, you can have an international partnership, which includes ESA as well. So, although I've differentiated between the teams, there's a lot of interworking between them. Got it. Well, we do have ESA working in Australia as well. But being here in Singapore at the GSTC, second year in a row for UK to be a featured country with the Singapore Space and Technology Limited. What are you doing in Singapore? We signed an MOU, or I saw an MOU being signed this morning uh, here already. Singapore and the UK Space Agency, what's the relationship and sort of where are the, the, the core aspects of that? So the UK and Singapore have had a long-standing strategic relationship in many different aspects, not just of science and technology, but in relation to security, in relation to governance, etc. The Singapore government has made a concerted effort now to concentrate on certain aspects of space capabilities that they see as essential to meet their national goals. So when we look at the themes of the conference, we've got space capabilities for smart cities, we've got space capabilities for secure connectivity, and space capabilities for sustainability. So with Singapore having decided there are a few strands it's going to focus on, they are aligned to UK areas of strength and opportunity. And by working together, not only can we get individual projects accelerated through, but of course there is a geopolitical element to that because Singapore is one of our longest standing like-minded nations like Australia that we've worked with historically for decades and which in a part of the world where we're seeing explosive growth, it is even more vital for the UK to develop further in deepening those partnerships. Well, In Space Mission signed that MOU, so it's a BAE systems company. So obviously that supports what you're doing here in the region anyway uh, from a space. How much, how broader is your involvement in the region? So we're involved with a number of the countries that are contributing to, to, to this Faraday program. So let's think about this. We're here in Singapore, and Singapore has got a catalytic role. But we've also got involvement from Thailand, we've got involvement from the Philippines, we've got involvement from Vietnam. So we've got other countries with space capabilities who are prioritizing them, not because of, of platforming, but because they recognize that the space capabilities that they can derive are absolutely essential as they're to map forward in a time period which is increasingly dominated by climate change, which is increasingly dominated by environmental concerns, 
but also where space is giving capabilities for economic growth. So we see our involvement with Singapore through the Faraday programme as being catalytic, not just for the UK-Singapore relationship, but for the potential to have a greater space partnership with other newly emergent space nations yeah. across the region. There's some funding in the back of that. Maybe talk us to that, how that funding is working or what's driving that funding. The funding's there to catalyse different priority areas put forward by different countries. So some countries within the partnership are focusing very much on having small instrumentation to develop their space science capabilities. Other countries in the partnership have said, no, we want to prioritise Earth observation capabilities and how we're going to use that in line with our national priorities. So when we look at the actual funding distribution, okay, that's very much aligned to what the individual nations and the individual research institutes or the individual companies were bringing to the table uh, and the amounts that they have deemed are going to be necessary for their part of the overall jigsaw. One thing, I, before I bring in the Australian Space Bridge, what's what, 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 the, what are the observations you're seeing you know, when you're talking to Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, Singapore? Are you seeing other sort of European Space Agency, UK Space Agency, any other space agencies in the region? Or do you find that you are taking that leadership role and, and key partnership role? Is it a gap? Is it an opportunity missed by others? Or, yeah, what, what, what's the, how would you describe that? Yeah, no, it, it's when we look at the countries that are attending here, be they from space agencies or be they from ambassadors that I was speaking to this morning. Uh, I've seen the French ambassador, I've seen the Polish ambassador, and it's fair to say that many countries, you know, spacefaring or otherwise, are looking to this region. And I think one of the reasons is, you know, if we go beyond the world of space, if we look at sort of levels of middle class population levels, and I know this will vary on, uh, upon a yeah. country. Uh, if we look at Europe and North America, the figure's about 350 million in, in North America, 350 million in Europe. In Asia, that figure is about 2 billion. Now, wind forward 15 years, the projections are that Europe and North American figures are, are pretty much going to be stagnating. But the growth in Asia is going to be explosive. It's going to go from 2 billion to 3.5 billion to potentially in excess of 4 billion. So if we use that sort of global middle class figure, with it, quotation marks around it because there's yeah. a variation as a proxy for consumer spending. You know, the future is increasingly going to be in Asia. It's increasingly going to be in South America. It's increasingly going to be in Southern and West Africa. This is a fundamental global recalibration. I think this is why so many countries are seeing the economic development that's happening in this region. More importantly, the ambitions by governments within this region and the ambitions for a, a regional population that's young, that's dynamic, and is really, really optimistic about the future. Put all of those into the mix, and you can see that the, 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 the space characteristics we see are part of, a, I think, a much more broad global focus on the Asia region as well as others. Well, we mentioned your second uh, year back to back for being the featured country here. Maybe we're almost into the third year now for the UK Space Bridge with Australia. Maybe an update on that and sort of how that is progressing and any sort of outlook for 2024? Yeah, I mean, it's going great guns. So, as you know, with, with the Space Bridge, certain areas for prioritisation. Now, what I really like about it is we've got, uh, you know, I'm an academic at heart and we've got a fundamental focus on, on space for Antarctic ice monitoring, space for Earth observation, but also We've got space capabilities for deep space communications. We've got space capabilities for connectivity. Again, in alignment with Australia's prioritisation, we've seen initial partnerships that have absolutely flourished. Uh, my chief executive and a UK delegation went very recently to Australia. Yeah. We've got ongoing dialogues, ongoing involvement. And this is not just on the, the civil space side. This is also in the use of space capabilities to safeguard our ways of life. And, and of course, with Australia being one of our closest partners uh, in both civil and in space security yeah. areas, we're delighted to see how, how the partnership has developed and we're really, really optimistic about the future. Well, I suppose to finish off, you've got a very interesting antecedent, a former science teacher, but also a, a renowned skydiver as well. But also 33 years since you've been in Singapore, which yeah. I was quite surprised about. Are you planning to do any skydiving while you're in the region? <laughs> I wish I had time. I've actually got to get back next week because I've, I've got a week with my MSc students where I've managed to clear the diary. Oh. But actually, one thing that's quite interesting on, 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 the, on the skydiving side, so um, people often talk about with human spaceflight, 
um, the overview of that. In fact, I, I remember, I was 16 years old when Paul Scully Powers flew on, on, on as an oceanographer, flew on the space shuttle, I think it was 1984. And I remember he was talking about this, and it was the first Australian in space. Um, when you jump out of a plane, I mean, people just say, why do you do it? And it's human body flight. You get to explore the third dimension in a way that, that, that's impossible to conceptualize unless you're doing it. But what you do is you recalibrate your relationship with the Earth in a very, very different way. And, and it's analogous to, I've been very lucky to work with colleagues who've operated my experiments in space. And it's analogous to that sort of overview effect. So I might be forcing it a little bit there. No, no, no. But I think there is a sort of linkage in how it changes your perspectives. When I read it, I was like, no, there's definitely an analogy there that you'd be able to draw upon. Uh, but Professor Anu Ajay, thank you so much for joining us today on Australia in Space TV. And it's great to have the UK Space Agency back on. Uh, it's great to talk to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.